Hi, Paul. It's nice, nice to see you again. Um, I was wondering, um, you're a very well-known scientist in the area of uh, nanocarbon materials, but I remember first met we were working on, on carbon nanotubes. So, so would you like to tell me a little bit about uh, how you came to be involved in the area of uh, carbon nanotube research? Somehow luck. <laughs> I was working... Uh, well, when I was invited when I was an undergrad to work on a, P, on a project related to carbon. And the person who, who was at that time my supervisor, he invited me then for a PhD. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wanted to start working with carbon nanotubes. And I thought that it was exciting, so I got the chance to set up a lab. You were very successful in your, in your uh, PhD and in the research you carried out. Um, but uh, you're now, now a professor. So it's quite a step from being a successful research scientist, doing a PhD, to becoming a professor. Would you like to say how that um, step came about? Well, I think that's... You mentioned luck. It's, yeah. It can't all be luck. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But I think it's a little bit of a combination of personality, of how eager you are uh, on doing certain kinds of things, on liking what you do, on liking your job, on uh, accepting the kinds of uh, opportunities and scenarios uh, where you are uh, not only on research, but also on, uh, uh, well, related to the kind of um, situations in which you are involved, like even cultural challenges, because, you know, being a scientist, you have to move from place to place many times. So I think that's what it brings uh, you to be a professor. I mean, to have luck, but also to like what you do and to be ready to do what you need to do on the right moment. Mm -hmm. So when you did your PhD research, was that in the same place you're now a professor? Or was no, no, no. I've, I've been moving quite a lot. Tell, tell us about the, geogra <laughs> the geography of your research. So I started my PhD in Brazil mm -hmm. and um, through a very interesting collaboration there, I uh, got the chance to do quite a lot in Mexico with a well-established group in the field mm -hmm. and uh, also in the United States I did some electron microscopy and uh, then afterwards for the one and a half uh, last years of my PhD, let's half of it let's say, I did my work at the IFW in Dresden in Germany mm -hmm. yep. and uh, then afterwards I moved for a postdoctoral position in Finland and from Finland I moved to Vienna as a F uh, Marie Curie Fellow uh, where I've been since then. <laughs> mm. So from being a researcher, then I got an assistant, well, what they call an uh, assistant uh, scientist in uh, Austria, and then I got a um, professorship, a named professorship called uh, Berta Kalik Professorship. That's, uh, yeah. I remember you telling me something about the Bertakali professorship, because mm -hmm. um, that's a, that was a special scheme that uh, you now tell me doesn't run anymore. Well, you know, in Europe there are many uh, initiatives to promote the career of many women in science. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Very admirable, but how does it actually work in practice? Yes, well, the, the, the University of Vienna has not tried many things. Uh, Austria is a, a country where the number of female professors in physics is probably among the lowest uh, if you compare it with other countries in Europe. Um, at the moment that I got my professorship, there were four female professors in the whole country. And um, I think that was one of the, one of the best ideas there. Uh, they wanted to have people that were uh, at different uh, stages of their career. And, uh, and to, to give these professorships, they wanted people to apply that had I had at some point, or at that we're holding actually at that moment, an excellence grant. Okay. So I had a, an excellence grant of the EU, so I could apply for it, and mm -hmm. and uh, I was favoured with that, and I was, uh, and it was very good. It was a very good experience, and it was something also very nice for for physics because Berta Kalik is one of the famous uh, Austrian physicist, Austrian female physicist. So it mm. was an honour and and a very good opportunity to move forward in my career. No, okay. you're a professor in, uh, uh, in the University of, uh, of Vienna. This is a well-known university. I remember looking around the quad there and seeing these statues of very famous scientists. It can be quite daunting. So what's it like for you as a female scientist and also as a foreigner uh, being a professor in the, what essentially is a, a German-speaking male-dominated environment? Uh, once, you are, once you feel integrated, you do not really, you do not really see as a 
as something that you want to do because because you want to show someone something it's just like a natural step so once you know that uh, that you are doing what you like uh, doing research in a very productive way but b because it's your hobby i think things start start to happen la naturally mm -hmm. to some extent of course you have to do some some extra work you have to to do your best uh, be on time on applying for things and so so on but this is this is something that as i said depends also on your personality so that plays a very important role so i think it's not magic i think uh, i think it's something that has some consequent steps mm -hmm. so how, how did you find um learning the foreign language and and also being able to communicate at a high level. Well, languages are part of uh, my hobbies in life. Oh, right. Okay. So <laughs> I, uh, I started learning languages when I was a kid, and I speak six languages at the moment. Wow. So I think that that's one of the things that helps you get integrated much better into a different society. You asked me about how I managed to do this in a competitive uh, mm, uh, yeah. society like, like the Austrian, I mean, scientific community like the Austrian. Well, that's, that's what it takes. I think that uh, that's being able to be integrated, knowing the, knowing the language uh, is a big plus. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the teaching, it's of course not like teaching in your mother tongue, right? But English is also not my mother tongue and, and I also have to teach in English otherwise. So... Um, yes. I think that I think that it is it is anyway a challenge <laughs> because you have to be in front of the people, uh, try to move your hands in 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 a certain way that you're able to transmit the message that the people get something from what you have. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that that's also one of the things that come naturally. Uh, in your research career, in your, in, uh, what do you think is your greatest achievement? Um, in your research? Was it um, the research you did uh, in your PhD or the continuation of research topics now that you're a professor? Well, to be honest, I think that the, t if I would tell you about the research topics specifically, it would be, it would be a, a bit unfair to myself because I've been doing lots of different things over the past years. Mm -hmm. I think that a big achievement for me is a chance that I had recently to uh, work on a very important uh, project for the development of science in developed countries. Oh, right. In not developed countries, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. And, yes. uh, and having this chance, this opportunity to inspire people mm -hmm. uh, with what I know, I thought it was very exciting. What do your students think about you? Do they find you a scary person, scarier than your male colleagues? Maybe when I'm angry, I'm very scary. Though. <laughs> but, but I am a, I think that I'm a, a, a real workaholic. So I think that puts a lot of pressure on students. So uh, if I travel a lot, I think people tend to relax. But then when it's about getting, delivering mm -hmm. results or writing up papers, thesis, I think they get stressed and they realize what it's like to be working <laughs> close to a workaholic mm -hmm. who doesn't care much about the sleeping hours, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you, Paola, for uh, agreeing to be interviewed. It's, uh, it's uh, not, an, not an easy thing to do, <laughs> and it's very, very kind of you to do that. Thank you for interviewing.